Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we have a special video and I am particularly excited about it because it is the second episode or installment in which we will talk about on-screen chemistry. A fascinating topic that we covered in a previous video in which I talked about 15 classic film couples that had great on-screen chemistry and you left some fantastic comments with more couples that you consider that had great chemistry as well so I, I was thinking for a while that I wanted to do a second video in which I could include those suggestions and maybe also do a bit more research and add even more couples to the ones that you suggested. So that is exactly what we're going to do in this video and also on this day I will talk about 10 couples in this case, classic film couples, that also had great chemistry but the twist or the added information in this video is that all except one, these couples are linked to the studio system, to the star system that made Hollywood famous for decades. Not that the previous video didn't include such couples, but it was a bit more eclectic. And I do think that this is a very interesting subject, so thank you so much for all your suggestions. They were super helpful. And it only made me realize that it was a very interesting topic and that on-screen chemistry and movie teams had been very important during the star system period so it's again another opportunity to keep on discovering and talking about movies and film history it is a fascinating topic so that's what we'll talk about today I have seen them described as dynamic duos as old-time movie teams or golden couples these are all terrific ways of designating one of the happiest formulas that Hollywood back in the studio system era and the star system era implemented to capitalize on the chemistry between their stars aside from the very obvious factor of two performers, two actors having chemistry on screen for these movie teams to actually work during studio system era there was a very important factor aside from chemistry to make this formula a success and that was repetition which speaking in movie terms would be continuity in the form of several films start by such couples. It was then a case of creating ideal couples for the public. Thus, audiences were able to identify with those characters, the qualities that each couple stood for, and that meant that audiences then were eager and just waiting for the next film with their favorite movie couple. In many cases, those movies had some sort of a repetitive plot or a quite similar plot from one film to the other and more often than not the outcome for the couple was the same in every movie. It varied depending on the couples, the genre and the studio as well and that's something that audiences were drawn to. This formula started pretty early on and it was perfected and very successful, especially during the 20s, the 30s, and the beginning of the 40s, with the start, I think, of World War II. And as television became more and more important, I think that there was a shift in terms of what audiences wanted from films. And slowly but surely, this formula of screen dynamic duos started slowly to fade out and they became less and less frequent so you would still have couples or actors who had chemistry doing more than one film together such as Rock Hudson and Doris Day for example but in general terms the number of movies they did together was significantly less. Also, in later decades, such as the 50s and the 60s, it wouldn't be so much a case of studios promoting this type of pairings. It would be a case of real-life couples making also several films together. In terms of the couples that were promoted by studios in earlier decades, they were more often than not also reflect 
the personality and the nature of the studio that was promoting them. We will find, to be fair, a lot of couples that were promoted by one studio that definitely excelled at this formula that was MGM for sure. Also, as we saw in the previous video, we will talk about chemistry, but not only necessarily in terms of romance, but in terms of connection between two people. Also, what I want to point out in this video is that even though I'm referring to those couples as a formula, they were so much more than that and that component that chemistry component is something that is very unpredictable but something that audiences would pick up instantly that we pick up instantly when we see two people on the screen together so it is again a fascinating topic i think it is something that you can't describe almost you cannot put your finger on but still you're always able to identify when you see it so again as with the previous video i hope that you enjoy it that you find also this topic as interesting and as fascinating as i do and that we have a great time talking about some fantastic classic movie couples that some of you suggested so thank you so much again for that and now with no more ado Let's jump into it. Okay, our first couple is a classic film couple that I almost included in my last video and that I so regret that I didn't. It was a crass mistake, a crass error. Big mistake, big, huge. And I'm so happy that some of you suggested it and it is the couple formed by Myrna Loy and William Powell. They start in 14 films together and for good reason. As Marina best described, from our very first scene, a curious thing passed between us, a feeling of rhythm, complete understanding, an instinct for how one could bring out the best in the other. They fit together like an olive fits a dry martini. No married couple was ever as glamorous, smart, sophisticated, playful as Nick and Nora Charles were in the Thin Man series and as Myrna Loy and William Powell were in all their movies together. In terms of chemistry, well, just take a look at them, shall we? You got types? Only you, darling. Lanky brunettes with wicked jaws. Leo, compliments to see you. Who is she? Oh, darling, I hope I wouldn't have to answer that. Come on. Powell was this debonair gentleman, wisecracking, extremely smart, attractive, playful. And Myrna Loy was charming, poised, but also equally playful, equally smart. I don't think you have to be a science expert to realize that they had an amazing compatibility and that rapport that they refer to is quite astounding. It got them, I believe, by surprise when they were first paired by Woody Van Dyke and it was an ease in their relationship that I think translates or trespasses the screen. They had a resounding success with the first Thin Man movie released in 1934 and as you know from then on they just repeated again the formula in this case devised or put together by MGM. So again, in their case, it was so much more than just chemistry. It was sheer professionalism, hence the endurance of their partnership, of their pairings. They had amazing comedic timing, both of them. They were at their best when they were teasing each other. And you can also see different but like-minded personality. So it's again, not only a case of a formula or chemistry, it was something that they worked at and they had fun with that even still today we can appreciate, we can enjoy, and it is a true gift from cinema. Another couple that was also mentioned in the comments of the previous installment of this chemistry series was the one formed by Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. And to be fair and to be honest with you, this was also a couple that I was very excited to include in this video. Nowadays, perhaps they are a bit overlooked, but they have a very solid fan base. They have a terrific web 
page devoted to them called Maketi. Also, I think the fans of Janek McDonald and Nelson Eddy are called Maketis, but I would definitely would love to be included as a Maketi if I can. And this particular webpage, Maketi.com, is an incredible source of information. I will leave a link down below if you're interested in Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. In this case, it is also a couple that made movies for MGM. Again, it was a studio that were the masters at promoting classic movie couples. And in this case, it was for the musical genre, for the operetta more specifically. And in this case, they made eight films together, being their most famous collaborations, movies like Naughty Marietta, which was their first, and it has some sort of a kinky title or <laughs> funny title, Naughty Marietta, and it was obviously a huge, huge success. They also starred together in Rosemary, which is an iconic musical from the 30s, which features James Stewart before he was famous, and it's something that I think you really have to see for yourself. It's a beautiful musical with songs like the Indian Love Call. So this movie is, I think, best represent the chemistry the true connection between Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald and their fabulous voices. Even though Jeanette McDonald had been previously very successful in her pairings with Maurice Chevalier in musicals directed by Ernst Lubitsch, like The Love Parade or The Merry Widow, again, she had been quite successful and was already well known. It was when she was paired with Nelson Eddy that audiences were enthralled by these two being together and sharing love scenes and singing to one another. Audiences could again pick up that there was something real between them. And again, if you read the maccaddy.com page, you will have lots and lots of information about how their relationship in real life was. As I learn more and more about her pairings with Nelson Eddy, I can really appreciate what they created together on screen. They were often directed by Woody Van Dyke, who also directed San Francisco and who was a personal friend for both. And you can see also that in that studio era, aside from the chemistry of the couple, aside from their professionalism as actors, you would have also other professionals such as the directors, cinematographers, the music department, the costume department that would just contribute so much to the success of those pairings that I think it's fair to also mention them. So together they created musical magic. Okay, next couple included, thanks to one of your comments, is the one formed by Greta Garbo and John Gilbert. Garbo herself has to be definitely one of the most intriguing and fascinating figures in cinema history. When she retired in 1941 at the age of 36, she had already achieved a superstar status all over the world. Even just the name of Greta Garbo has become an icon. So I think it's very difficult to find a similar case in movie history. She was for sure one of, again, most fascinating, most intriguing personalities and figures. She was a Swedish actress and when she arrived in Hollywood, they didn't quite know what to do with her. So initially she was cast or a typecast as a vamp, the predecessor of the femme fatale. She was the embodiment of sex and those were the kind of roles that she was being offered by the time she met and she was paired with John Gilbert in 1926 for the movie Flesh and the Devil. In turn, John Gilbert was already an established silent actor at that time. It was her definitive leap to stardom and it also helped 
John Gilbert tremendously. The chemistry was undeniable, it was super hot, and it is quite a risque movie even nowadays with several very very sexy scenes. The Hays Coat was not in place yet so it must have been a true bomb in its time. Again, in this case the expert direction of Clarence Brown and also cinematographer William Daniels made absolute movie magic. The, the way they are photographed, the way they were shot, it's so sexy that even nowadays the reaction of an audience who hasn't seen this movie yet must be amazing. With the resounding success of that movie and also their off-screen romance being highly publicized, being highly exploited and exposed in the media, they became one of the sensations in Hollywood. So they put them together again in the movie Love, released in 1927, a year later, and I think it's based or loosely based on Anna Karenina and also later in the movie A Woman of Affairs. And I think those movies repeated the premise of the forbidden love between them and that's something that again audiences were just craving for. By 1933 tables had turned, Garbo was an absolute star while Gilbert was in decline. He was not able to successfully transition from silent films to talking features. Their off-screen romance or love wasn't successful either so it was at her request that he was cast with Garbo for the movie Queen Christina which was their last film together and although it was again another success it didn't help Gilbert's career much and he eventually passed away at the age of 38 sadly but in any case what's left it's their art and their chemistry and their talent and what they share together and that is something that will remain forever. All right, another ideal couple or ideal match promoted by MGM was the one formed by Greer Garson and Walter Pidgeon. Their dramas were very popular during the 40s and proof of that is that they ended up making eight movies together. Their films might feel a bit dated today but their impact on audiences especially during World War II was tremendous. Their appearance together in Mrs. Miniver would be the one that left forever an indelible mark on audiences memories and it's their most iconic I'd say appearance. It helped solidify especially Greer Garson's image at a time when audiences needed someone to inspire them. She became that figure that represented for audiences the courage, the strength during those war years. She became at that period MGM's top star. Greer Garson in combination with Walter Pidgeon represented the perfect, the ideal married couple whose again strength and courage was exactly what audiences needed to see at that time. Their first movie together was also quite significant it's called Blossoms in the Dust and it was released in 1941. It was based on a true story of Edna Gladley who fought for orphan children born out of marriage for the word illegitimate to be erased from their birth charts so that they could be adopted as any other children. So it was quite a powerful part and audiences responded very well to Garson's performance and to her pairing with Walter Pidgeon, hence MGM wanting them to be together as soon as possible in another movie. Then came Mrs. Miniver that we have previously mentioned and it was directed by the brilliant William Wyler who would always get an Oscar winning performance from actors and actresses and this was no exception. Greer Garson would go on to win the Best Actress Academy Award that year. Their third movie together was Madame Curie. Then came Mrs. Parkinson and a change of pace with the comedy Julia Misbehaves. But unfortunately it wasn't as successful as the image that again the formula that the studios had promoted of them and after World War II their fame had 
faded out a bit they would team up again for that foresight woman and although it was a drama again a period drama their characters were also quite different from their successful previous films they would then reprise again their roles as mr and mrs miniver but again it was in 1950 and audiences were not so keen on the message on the image that they were portraying so they did one last movie called scandal at scoury but audiences tastes were changing as well as i was commenting in the beginning of this video that audiences would forever remember them as mr and mrs miniver and although in this movies her parts, Greer Garson parts were favorite, I would say, and the story would revolve more around her, and hence the titles like Mrs. Miniver, Mrs. Parkinson, Julia Misbehave. They were a wonderful partnership. And as I read in real life, Walter Pigeon was a true sport. They were great friends behind the cameras and they would remain very close for as long as they lived. So here I am again with another fantastic classic film couple and in this case is a comic classic film couple it's a comic duo and i don't think that you could find a funnier act than that of stan laurel and oliver hart comedy the duo consisted of clumsy and childlike Stan Laurel and grumpy and pompous Oliver Hardy they reached international fame and thanks to television and reruns of their movies together and their gags they achieved lasting fame and they became iconic they appeared together in over a hundred films those would include short features and long features in a collaboration in a career together that would span over many decades from the 20s until the 50s the bulk of their collaboration together was made from 1927 until 1938 those were the their most productive years together and in those years also they transitioned they successfully transitioned from silent movies to talking features after them there came bud abbott and lou costello who also had great chemistry and also movie screen teams such as bing crosby and bob hope with Dorothy Lamour, I'd say, so it would be a comic trio and also Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. By the way, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were featured in our previous video, so go check that out if you love them too. They began appearing together in short features produced by Hal Roach Studio. They quickly became friends and that translated into a non-screen chemistry that didn't go unnoticed their complicity they're dealing with everyday situations their funny slapstick their clumsiness their obvious physical contrast was key to their success it was director leo mccary in this instance the one that helped this formula this couple this comedy duo succeed directing some of their films and writing some of their films. After a while, Hal Roach Studios sold the distribution rights to MGM and that is when their collaboration started to struggle because the big studio MGM started to offer them roles in movies that were not so much in line to what they initially became famous for. In later years, their work also for the 20th Century Fox with similar results with constant meddling from producers from the studio and that triggered their decline i don't know if you heard about it but there was a recent movie made or quite recent movie starring john c Riley and steve coogan that explored the last years of their careers and their complicity and their relationship i haven't personally watched it but i think it would be interesting aside from watching their movies and their features 
um, it might be interesting to watch that and see how they approached the careers of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. It was again a case of having TV reruns of their movies and that made other generations fall in love with them, enjoy their comedy act, and they influenced many comic actors. And it is again a case of a tremendous legacy from another classic film couple. Making nine films together, the second classic comedy couple that I wanted to include in this video is the one formed by Joan Blondell and Glenda Farrell for Warner Brothers in this case. Even though Joan Blondell was already a box office success for Warner Brothers on her own, she found fame with Glenda Farrell in a series of movies in which they played gold diggers released in the 30s. A fantastic female comedy double act. They would be fast-paced, sassy, and terrific. They were both signed with Warner Brothers and again as I was saying although Joan Blondell had already achieved fame during the depression era and early 30s with pre-code movies. I believe their first appearance together even though Glenda Farrell was not credited was in the movie called Three on a Match but it was the movie Havana Widows released in 1933. Violet got a Marine's name tattooed on her arm last night. By this time that arm must read like a regimental roll call. This morning, and I've lost 15 pounds around my neck. Look again tonight, dearie. Maybe it just slipped down. And then they made I've Got Your Number, Kansas City Princess, The Traveling Sales Lady, We're In for the Money, Miss Pacific Fleet, and their last film together, I believe it's Gold Diggers of 1937. Again, if on their own they were quite amazing, talented actresses together, they were the perfect partners in crime, quit witted, supportive with one another, funny, smart, resourceful. Their movies were quite successful at the box office, but inevitably the formula or their movies became quite repetitive and they started playing the characters over and over again. So in Glenda Farrell's case, after her contract with Warner Brothers expired, she moved on to Universal and she didn't quite achieve that level of success that she had had at Warner Brothers, but she would sporadically also appear during the 50s and the 60s. In the case of Joan Blondell, as I already said, she was the queen pretty much of Warner Brothers during the Depression era and before the Hays Code was put in place and until Betty Davis became also the biggest female star of the Warner Brothers lot. Joan Blundell was the showgirl, the career girl, the gold digger, the sass mouth, master one-liner. They were both masters at one-liners. And again, in the case of Joan Blundell, she also parted ways with Warner Brothers in 1939. And she, I believe she then went on her own to other studios, again, with not as much success with pre-code movies. But also, as many of you know, she made a stellar comeback with a character in the classic Grease, with a terrific performance as the waitress vibe. And she is for sure an actress that I'm really fond of and that I know that many of you are fond of as well. We're changing pace now from comedy to adventure with another classic film couple that was promoted by a studio, in this case again by MGM, and that is the couple formed by Maureen O'Sullivan and Johnny Weissmuller. Although there had been five actors that had previously played the role of Tarzan in silent movies, it was Johnny Weissmuller, the first Tarzan, to appear in a sound feature. And he forever became the ideal, the iconic, representation of the Edgar Rice Burroughs character. Paired with Maureen Sullivan, they made 
six movies together and it was also a case of unlikely chemistry between two very different actors that were unknown or relatively unknown. Maureen O'Sullivan was an Irish actress. She appeared in the 30s in quite a few good movies like the adaptation of Pride and Prejudice or The Thin Man. And then we had Johnny Weissmuller who was an athlete, he was a swimming champion, an Olympic champion who had little to no experience in films and quite by chance became Tarzan and again their pairing and their chemistry was uh, and is a surprise for everyone. I think their first movies are quite interesting to watch because they were pre-code and they were quite risque because of the revealing costumes or lack of costumes that they wore and the situations that and dialogues that became really famous and really associated with Tarzan and Jane. The winning formula in those days for audiences was the combination of having an exotic background, of having action, spectacular action for its day, the physical prowess and again also having these very sexy scenes with Jane. There was a huge commotion back in the day especially involving her costume or her lack of costume in their earliest films so I think that by their third film the Hays Code was already in place so it, it was not as risque but by all means very interesting as part of Hollywood history in terms of censorship and as I said Maureen was the one who got it pretty bad because of the wardrobe and it had to be altered, it had to be changed to accommodate the morales of the era. So their first film was Tarzan the Ape Man in 1932, their second was Tarzan and his mate which some consider their best and it features some of these situations that I'm referring to. Then Tarzan escapes and Tarzan finds a son which incorporated to the pair also with Cheetah obviously. They incorporated a son, a boy that Tarzan and Jane would adopt, played by Johnny Sheffield. And their last two movies were Tarzan's Secret Treasure and Tarzan's New York Adventure in 1942. And that's where their pairings ended. They were action movies that audiences loved, especially younger generations. So again, I think that it was a classic film couple that had a tremendous impact. Real life couple formed by Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton was far from ideal and it was certainly not promoted by a studio as theirs was not a match built by Hollywood but as I was saying in the beginning a result of a real-life pairing making several films together a result of a very disastrous yet fascinating film we're talking obviously of Cleopatra released in 1963 and directed by Joseph Mankiewicz a production that everyone involved recalls as a nightmare but that had one positive outcome for Elizabeth and Richard because their sensational affair reached international proportions and they would start one of the most famous love-hate on-screen off-screen relationship that would translate into two marriages and 11 films together. My were quite famous on their own especially Elizabeth Taylor as the quintessential Hollywood actress and Richard Burton as this British stage actor with a fantastic voice. These were two very different performers but also together they helped each other's career quite a lot. Their chemistry was undeniable and it fascinated audiences and especially the media. They capitalized on their romance and film productions as well with movies such as The VIPs and The Sun Piper. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? which resulted in Elizabeth Taylor's second Oscar for Best Actress. The Taming of the Drew, which is my personal favorite of theirs, but controversies aside, their legacy in terms of classic film pairings and iconic film couples is undeniable. A huge dilemma I had here when thinking about the next classic film couple with great chemistry. If there was an actor that absolutely reigned during 
the studio system and star system era that was Gar Gable and in my opinion quite like Cary Grant he had lots of chemistry with different actresses that he worked with such as Claudette Colbert and Joan Crawford and Jean Harlow and Myrna Loy so it was quite a dilemma which couple to choose from because they're all amazing I love all the actresses but I have a personal preference and that is the classic movie pairing consisting of Clark Gable and Jean Harlow. I know that he had lots of chemistry with Joan Crawford and he made quite a number of films with her and again too with Claudette Colbert and Myrna Loy but with Jean Harlow I, I have a special fondness for them and that is what I ended up choosing Clark Gable and Jean Harlow as another classic film couple to include in this video. They made six movies together. Their first movie together though, it was called The Secret Six, released in 1931 and there was not a prospect for them to have such a connection together because they were both two newcomers, two insecure newcomers, but by the time they were reunited a year later for Red Dust, they were hotter than July. Always in that color? Mm-hmm. Always been a tailhead. And you always shut your face off that way? Well, I like that. <laughs> it is a film that some of you might know because it was remade in the 50s also with Clark Gable for the movie called Mogambo directed by John Ford with Ava Gardner and Grace Kelly but if I had to choose there is no doubt for me I, I would go for Red Dust the best of the two in my opinion with again Clark Gable, Jean Harlow, Mary Astor who is brilliant in this film. In those days Harlow was promoted as the blonde bombshell. She had made a movie directed by Frank Capra called Platinum Blonde and that was the nickname that she would be given from then on. Even though she had a very short-lived career because she passed away sadly at the age of 26. She was so much more in my opinion than that. She had a tremendous comedic timing and she was especially good at representing the somewhat vulgar and unrefined woman but at the same time with extreme lucidity, super smart and appear to the audience as a very tender, very relatable character. I was reading a book the other day. Reading a book? Yes, it's all about civilization or something. A nutty kind of a book. Mm. Do you know that the guy says that machinery is going to take the place of every profession? Oh my dear. That's something you need never worry about. Gable, on the other hand, was also being promoted by the studio, by MGM, as a sensational leading man and by all means he achieved that status. He became the king of Hollywood. After the monumental success of Red Dust, MGM obviously thought of other productions that would again capitalize on their chemistry, on their amazing sexual chemistry and they would start in in the movie Hold Your Man and also in China Seas which mirrored again very much their success with Red Dust. They also starred in the movie Wife vs. Secretary with Myrna Loy and James Stewart and sadly their final film together was Saratoga released in 1937 that sadly also Jean Harlow wasn't able to finish and it was finished by three stand-ins I believe or three doubles. Again their chemistry together was absolutely electrifying and their legacy in films is eternal. Another classic film couple that in this case was promoted by the 20th Century Fox and that I think gets quite overlooked and it is not as remembered perhaps or as well known nowadays is the one formed by Janet Gaynor and Charles Farrell, our second Farrell in today's video, totally unrelated to Glenda Farrell. 
that I'm aware of though. <laughs> Gaynor had quite an important career as an actress because she won the first Academy Award ever given to an actress for Sunrise, a song of two humans directed by Murnau. And she also appeared in the first A Star Is Born movie directed and written by William Wellman, but also an actress that was at the peak of her popularity when she was paired with Charles Farrell. They were a box office favorite and if Garbo and Gilbert were the hottest, Gaynor and Farrell were the most romantic team of the day. They were frequently directed by Frank Borsage. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, not too sure. Who directed them in movies like The Seventh Heaven, Street Angel or Lucky Stars. They transitioned to talking features and their last movie together was 1934's Change of Heart. Charles Farrell though was a very handsome actor, very attractive, very agreeable, tender, athletic and he was the epitome of the leading man back in his day but again it was his pairings with Janet Gaynor that garnered greater popularity for him. He eventually retired from movies in 1941 but again they made audiences hearts skip a bit and they were one of the most popular couples back in the day and for those reasons i wanted to include them in today's video all right so that was all for today's video i hope that you enjoyed it and that you were happy with the couples that i mentioned today by all means i wish that you leave comments down below for which couple was your favorite which couple did you love the most if there's still other couples that I missed and that you would want me to include in even a third video. As I said before, this is a fascinating topic that has proven to be more interesting than I had even anticipated. So by all means, I would love to try to tackle it from even another angle or try to include more couples in a third video. That would be quite amazing. But that obviously also depends on you. So if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with people who also love these couples. That would be super fantastic and greatly appreciated, to be honest. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for sharing the love for classic movies, for sharing the love for chemistry for classic movie couples and stay safe, take care and see you all in my next video. Bye! Another pair, the pair? Apple pair? With really famous iconic songs like the Indian, like Indian, like the Indian phone call, phone call, <laughs> had they achieve elastic, elastic?